All right, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining this session. Um, I believe, as well as Taylor Swift, the Reform Party are launching their uh, policy documents. So thanks for coming to this, uh, rather than going to see Mr. Farage, wherever he may be. But we're not here to talk politics. We're here to talk about vulnerability and tech. And more specifically, um, does your technology support vulnerability? So this is a massive topic. I'm sure you'll all agree. And we've got 30 minutes. So without further ado, just going to get our esteemed panel. And uh, a big thank you to Chris Fitch, who, despite the UK rail infrastructure, has made it. Um, it was a bit of a worrying call at 10 o'clock this morning um, when, he, when all the trains out of Paddington uh, were cancelled out, out to Wales. But yeah, thank you for Chris for being here. So um, let's start with uh, Raminta. Do you want to introduce yourself just a little bit about what you do at GAMCARE? Uh, hi, everyone. So my name is Raminta Deliso, and I work for GAMCARE, which is a national charity supporting anyone affected by gambling harms. And um, about two, three um, two uh, thirds of people contacting the National Gambling Helpline experience financial difficulties and debt. So in my role, I work closely with financial services sector to address that gambling harm as a vulnerability. Uh, so I work closely with banks and the debt advice sector. Brilliant. Thank you for joining us. Beth. Yeah, hi, I'm Beth Whelan. I'm the Chief Strategy and Transformation Officer at TVX Group, which is the debt services division of Equifax. So we um, support uh, uh, all of the sort of industry um, from government through to telco, banks, um, and uh, help them manage their panel of suppliers to help consumers resolve their debt situation. Thank you. And finally, Chris. Lovely. It's, uh, so I'm Dr. Chris Fitch. I'm from the Money Vice Trust and University at Bristol, and I'm the host of Britain's favourite vulnerability podcast, Vulnerability Matters. Do, uh, do, trying to get listenership up into double figures. So kind of a do, do listen. A, Thank you, yeah. Chris. So, so um, as I was just sort of sitting, sitting there, I was thinking about, obviously, you know, the world of tech and whether it is or it isn't able to really support vulnerable customers. But there's a really great example of tech supporting uh, a particular type of vulnerability right above us. So how amazing that we've got live subtitling. And, you know, there is a session later on today uh, around the needs of deaf customers. And as, a, as, as somebody who lip reads um, and, and really does struggle, you know, as a hearing aid wearer, just seeing that is, you know, a real credit to credit strategy. So, so thank you for doing that. Um, really, really first time I've seen it. So absolutely fantastic. Right, let's get cracking on. So you can't help but have noticed, obviously, the, the drive to support vulnerable customers over the last uh, 10 years. Um, but new technology and, in some case, old technology. Um, Raminta, you know, in terms of where we've got with technology support for vulnerable customers, from, from your particular angle, is it working? Is it doing a good job? Yeah, so um, over the last couple of years, we've seen a great deal of innovation in um, the way that banks and other financial services support uh, vulnerable consumers affected by gambling harm, and that's mainly through uh, bank gambling blocks, um, and they work by blocking certain merchant category codes uh, and block uh, transactions to gambling operators, um, whether that's an online operator or a, a casino or a betting shop. Um, so uh, that's one of the main tools that we recommend to people that come to us uh, and get uh, help and support from us around their gambling, who want to stop gambling. Uh, some um, banks also offer um, gambling block limits, sorry, not gambling block limits, but gambling limits, so you can set the amount that you want to spend on gambling. Uh, so that's within the financial services sector. Outside financial services, there are also self-exclusion schemes. There are um, things like blocking software. So there, there's a great variety of tools that we should all recommend to any uh, customer who is experiencing gambling harm. I mean, that's a, that's a really great example of, of significant progress in a relatively small amount of time. So uh, thank you for that. So um, Beth, from your perspective, tech, tech for good, tech's working, what specifically are you seeing in your world? 
Yeah, so I think all technology, but something that's uh, really advanced in the last couple of years is around speech analytics. And I think there's a couple of things in that space that feel really exciting. One is the, the rich insights that sit within that unstructured data. Um, we're working with a university that's um, really making amazing progress in this space of actually trying to learn more about the consumer through that unstructured insights. And actually, the example that they were talking us through the other day was on a reloan portfolio where they could uh, use that data to identify people who on the surface appeared fine, but actually there was something else going on. And it was 3 to 4% of the portfolio that would have uh, received um, additional um, uh, credit that actually there was something going on that they were able to identify would default in the next 12 months. And so it's that combination of unstructured with structured data that was able to, for, to help them do some really amazing things in that space. And then I think the second part to it is just that agent resilience and the ability to actually give um, technology to the agents who, if you think about all of the easier stuff that's gone into that digital channel, they're left with much more complicated, harder cases. And so being able to have have in-call support, nudges, advice, being able to get um, a download of the call that they've just finished uh, in real time, so it it's really helps their learning journey, as well as then having some of that simulation of, of real calls for them to go and practice maybe on areas that they don't feel very comfortable with, um, or things that could be really triggering for them, that the situation that they can then practice that ahead of the call, I think is just great strides and another example of where technology is really helping. Yeah. It's really interesting on the sentiment analysis because that wasn't the original sort of what the, the user case for sentiment analysis. I mean, it's going back some time, but it, was it originally specifically around complaints? Was that? And then it's just been developed and, and utilised further. So yeah. again, some of the, you know, you, you might be thinking, oh, you know, we haven't got a massive investment budget here, but actually you've got some potentially some existing tech that can support. So um, Chris, come on then, come and, come and, come and be a bit more, um, I don't know, what's the word? Controversial. RC. Yeah. Okay. yeah you funny. might say yeah, that. Okay. <laughs> it, it, are you a fan of the new tech, the old tech? What's your well, thoughts? Well, if you say you're not a fan of tech, it makes you sound like Steptoe and Son. You're like kind of like, oh, I can't. This new topical technology. reference yeah. there yeah, yeah, for I like the, the audience. audience um, I, I think the key thing is it's um, we we bandy about these words uh, and we never define them. And I think the problem with technology, I can't believe I just said that. The problem with technology is often we focus on innovation rather than infrastructure. So what you do is you get pockets of things that look amazing, that sound amazing, that get nominated for awards, that are sold to you as well. Um, but actually, if you speak, I, if you listen to the most recent episode of Vulnerability Matters, very good podcast, um, Liz Jackson, who's a disabled writer from the US, says what we want is we don't want innovation, we want infrastructure. So let's give you a couple of examples. So if you think about like, a, let's take a non-tech one, just to kind of put in there. Uh, stair climbing wheelchairs. I get a lot of it. Every now and then you get an article. It's probably one in your news feed like this morning about a wheelchair that can climb stairs. But why aren't we building accessible buildings? I mean, that's a classic example of innovation that everyone goes nuts about as opposed to infrastructure. If you think about it in terms of tech, yeah, it's great that we've got speech analytics. Yeah, it's fantastic. But actually, we can spend so much time using tech to identify vulnerability and harm. We don't think about the support package or putting as much in, in emphasis on what are the reasonable adjustments, what are the support options to put into place. I think we fetishize technology. I think we go completely overboard, we get lost. Why? Because it's easy to make an announcement. Because it's great to put in an award submission. And because people are like, they're captured by the moment. But the harder graph, the harder yard is actually, how do we create infrastructure? How do we do that? And that's difficult for us because we often think about our own individual firms. Okay, what are the things we can do as an individual firm? Actually, to create infrastructure, and if you are going to contribute to these wider debates, and we'll get to them later on around infrastructure, it's going, to t- it's going to take some alignment, it's going to take some collaboration, and it might take you being told to do it by the government. And on that happy note, I'll kind of hand back to the chair. So, fetishising so. vulnerability tech, I don't think that's going to maybe appear on any sort of credit strategy brochure any, anytime <laughs> soon, but it's a really interesting point, because actually the headlines of that amazing new wheelchair but the cost of implementing that and the accessibility for, for multiple consumers to access that will be incredibly small, but it will get those headlines. Take another z- example, yeah? Um, think about cards. So yeah, we all have uh, credit cards, debit cards, and there's been a bit of a push recently. Look at your own debit card or credit card. Has it got a notch in it? Yeah, and we've seen them creep in from about 2015 onwards, notches into cards, so people are sight impaired 
uh, can, t can tell which way round to put it in or which card it is. Actually, that's great, and we give ourselves a round of applause, we go, well done. But then we, we've got a payment system that increasingly uses flat screen technology for kind of payment uh, terminals that people with sight impairment can't use. There's a contradiction here, so I think innovation is great, but infrastructure is better. Okay. The unintended uh, consequences of that sort of, you know, that Uber tech fetishizing. I feel I've lost the room. I think Sorry, you might have okay, done. Okay. Right, don't forget <laughs> that you um, that you can um, ask questions. So please, if you if you want to, you know, challenge any of our panelists or um, ask any really challenging questions, then, then please get your questions in. So in terms of so let's let's come back, and I think we we've we've started onto this. But are we really missing some of the fundamentals in our you know, ambition for sort of data and technology. And, and I come back really to you, Raminta, you know, we, open banking got touched on earlier. But if you're an open banking organization and you're spotting gambling, you know, we, we know we've all got all that great stuff. But what about other addictions? So I can remember in a previous organization, um, we had a, a breakdown of somebody's spending and it, it was, you know, Coral, as in the betting company. And then it was um, bargain booze, Coral, bargain booze, bargain booze, Coral, Coral, Coral. And that was it, pages and pages. Now we could have a conversation about the gambling, but what's technology enabling us to do with an, other addictions? Do we even go there? Because technology lets us know that, but are we making an assumption? Big, bit of a difficult question, but it, yeah. it feels like the tech is there, but what, 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 what do we do with it? I think, um, yes, absolutely, technology, and especially open banking recently has really opened the eyes of, you know, uh, lenders and creditors to, to the extent of gambling harm that is happening out there. But more and more um, creditors, uh, financial services, fintechs are coming to us and asking, Actually, we are seeing a lot of crypto um, happening on customer accounts. What can we do about that? So yes, I think there's definitely an opportunity to explore not only how can we block gambling and allow consumers to block gambling, but how can we block and support consumers who are affected by gambling like purchases such as crypto and other types of volatile trading. So yeah, great question. <laughs> Chris. Yeah. Do you want to build on that? Okay. So I think it's about, it's about basics. I mean, it's great that we've got captioning here, for example, today. But we should take that for granted. It's a fairly basic accessibility thing. Same with our own data architecture within our organizations. If we're not answering the vulnerable to what question, what harm, what difficulty, what disadvantage, what loss, and identifying the support need, then our data architecture is weak. And if we're building technology stacks on top of that, actually those technology st stacks are going to be weak we can go super narrow. There's always a flavor of the day or a flavor. And gambling, um, I come from an addictions background in terms of research. Thank goodness it's there and it's getting the attention it deserves. But actually, there are other use cases around uh, learning disability. So something um, that's good to look up is called Simply Readable. Um, it's by Swindon Borough Council. It's not often I promote work by Swindon Borough Council. Here we go. And it's an open source AI um, uh, translation service that will take your materials and turn them into easy read for people with learning disabilities. So not just simpler text, but also pictorial and images as well. But it doesn't, it doesn't tend to get the kind of um, the attention it, it deserves. And I think we also remember innovation, technology is just um, the application of knowledge to solve problems. So yeah, your shoes are technology. I mean, you won't be able to get in this room without. I would like to see everybody come in without shoes on. That'd be interesting. But technology is, can be really basic. So look at things like Nationwide Bank. They've introduced a set of cards for branches for people who are non-verbal to enable them to communicate. So it doesn't have to cost a lot. You don't have to buy it from anybody. But it should be trying to solve that problem of vulnerable to what, what support do they need, and what do we put in place? I still haven't won the room over. Okay. okay, okay. So, um, I mean, this is a question that comes up um, time and time again. And, and Beth, I'm going to come to you. It's sorry to do this, but it's a question that's just come up. So, in terms of the digitally excluded, so, and I think this builds on your point. So, there's lots of shiny new bits of kit, but what about those that are digitally dis excluded? You know, what are we leaving them behind in that? that shiny new award-winning stuff? 
Yeah, I totally agree. We can't. Uh, so digital has its place. I think there's so many positives from digital. Um, we know, for example, between 12 and 6 a.m. in the morning, 16% of people want to make a payment through that digital channel. Um, we know that it can be easier to um, disclose vulnerability um, where you're doing that through a digital channel rather than having to say it out loud or be, have that risk of being overheard. So I definitely think it has its place, and I think it's great that we're seeing that move to... Um, digitized journeys. However, there is always going to be the need, I think, to, to offer an omni-channel capability and to be able to flex depending on what people need and to ensure that people who aren't um, able to access services through digital channels still have the same equal opportunity to be able to resolve their situation. And I think that's the same in it, whichever way you look at it. If it's somebody that can't engage digitally, they need to have the ability to to resolve their situation and there not be a cost or a barrier that they're facing that somebody who can engage digitally doesn't face. And I think the flip side of that is the same when you're looking at anyone with support needs. We need to be able to build journeys um, and design those journeys with those people's support needs in mind. And we can't assume that we understand them. I think we need to do it with the people that we're building it for. We need to make sure that we've got people who've got those lived experiences helping us make those, uh, d design those, and then kind of building on what you said in terms of that execution side of it. Um, we then need to make sure that any journey we've, um, we've designed, we execute well. So if you put somebody into uh, a queue to to speak to an agent and it's 45 minutes, that's a barrier then, that's an additional cost that they're having to incur to get to the same end point that somebody that can just go through that digital Potentially channel. ending up with a two-tier system. Exactly. So and that's, it's all that's, about gonna, that's, a, that's a real challenge, isn't it? It yeah. really is a challenge. Um, so Chris, somebody would like to get into a, a, a bit of a spa. Um, however, they okay. support your view. Oh, um, okay. How do other companies receive your ideas about innovation versus infrastructure? I worry we are far too stuck in the data that we have lost the person within it all. What, why is that person not on the panel? I don't have to say it's kind of... <laughs> um, what a great question. Um, I think, so, with the infra so you deal with your own infrastructure first. So, you know, KYVC, uh, know your vulnerable customer. What does our customer base look like? What does our target market look like? What are they vulnerable to? Have we got a sense of um, the buckets, the FCA buckets, you know, uh, life events, health, capability, resilience, safety. Into we get those basics done because that's our building blocks. That's our foundation. Once we do that, we then think about introducing kind of layered approaches. If there's more people perhaps who are susceptible to gambling harms, we introduce the fantastic work that um, Gambler Aware have done. We might use speech analytics more widely. And this is, I mean, do come and see me talking about this later on. There is going to be a huge push towards data sharing, not just down the manufacturer and distributor kind of supply chain, which the consumer duty talks about. But actually, I think, uh, you probably, I don't know anyone uh, noticed this announcement. Before the um, Rishi Sunak stood in the rain, announced there was an election, there was an announcement from government saying they're going to um, introduce a share once support register for water, energy, and telecoms. And they held off from mentioning financial services. But we've got a change of government probably coming up. We've got a change of emphasis on what consumers want in sharing their reasonable adjustments across multiple firms in one go. I wouldn't be surprised if actually financial services, credit services, gets brought into this. And I think it's far better that the people in the room are leading that discussion alongside people with lived experience rather than responding to a government that's built it on an energy and water cookie cutter. So I say infrastructure is coming. So you yeah, need to and, and, and I think there was the, the note from the UK Regulators Network specifically around a more of a joined up, and that comes back into your infrastructure, around collections specifically, around the, the service and the, the expectations that people can receive. So there's, there's definitely that mood music, and it will, having worked in the energy sector and understood the sort of the complexities of data sharing between two sectors, you're then going to throw in another two. It's, it's, it's going to be interesting. I, I'm absolutely sure about it. Um, so this is this is a really good question. So is the challenge the technology, or firms' culture to apply the technology? Who'd like to take that? Beth, you had a smile when you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it comes back to what I was saying before. Really, I think so. So technology will have the limits that I think we build into it in the end. I think there's an opportunity for. Um, us to do some amazing things if we think about kind of the explosion of AI and, and, and all the innovation that's coming. I think we're really lucky actually within our careers to have something that's so potentially disruptive in terms of the way that we, um, we operate. 
um, and the things that we can do differently. However, it's only going to be as good as the data and the w uh, that we feed it and the way that we design um, and use it because ultimately it's going to do what we're kind of feeding it in the end. And so it kind of comes back to that. You know, we've seen some great examples of it, it being used really well in call centers to replicate agents um, and to improve customer experience. We can see that in some of the CSAT schools. Um, but there will always be those unintended consequences if we don't implement it in the right way. So I think absolutely, um, you know, I, there's one example, I think it was a holiday company that was started to give away refunds through their AI chatbot where they'd not uh, designed it correctly and it was against their policy and suddenly they wanted to pull back, but it was their responsibility, it was their chatbot, they had designed it. So, you know, there will be those unintended consequences and, and even more so if we don't, consider the support needs and, the, and, and people that have potentially more complex situations, if we don't consider that up front, we don't capture that information up front in that journey, and we don't design the journeys with them, um, co-innovating in that space with us, I think we'll have more unintended consequences um, through using that technology in the wrong way, effectively, yeah. or just making assumptions about what people's needs are. Coming on the AI point, and then a point about culture, um, so two things to look out for. One is a uh, synapse, um, spelled S-I-G-N uh, rather than synapse, which is uh, using AI to produce um, uh, BSL interpretation, British Sign Language interpretation. It's being embedded into airports and train stations. Absolutely fantastic. That's about creating infrastructure. In terms of AI as well, um, a really use, interesting use case is Shout. Do people know Shout, the 24-7 SMS tech service? They have, they use large language models to create um, pseudo uh, vulnerable customers or vulnerable um, texters. So people can actually be trained to deal with suicide, self-harm, uh, very challenging situations by an AI chatbot before they actually um, go on um, and uh, deal with wider customers. In terms of culture, I mean, and hallelujah. Do you know when you go to the FCA website, you're, you're probably like me, like Mark Wahlberg, I'll get up at 4.30 a.m., do a bit of meditation, maybe some weights, and then get in the FCA glossary. Um, and you get in the FCA glossary, and you realize, oh, they don't even define outcome, but yet they want us to kind of do it. But they, FCA for once have defined what culture is. So if there's one thing you can take from me from this panel, 10.26 of the consumer duty, and for AI and technology, this is really important. If you're going to embed it, you're going to need to show purpose, leadership, us, the people, and governance. That's supposed to plug. So that seems to be a very fitting kind of a metaphor for technology and culture. Well, we all know that culture reach strategy. Usually for people applaud at that point. But yeah. Whatever, yeah it's like, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I've got no shame. I've got no shame. It's kind of, oh, you, know. you were talking, you were dissing people that were salespeople earlier. I think, I think, think you've missed your vocation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think I'm going to come to you here, Ramon. I'm going to combine two, two, two pieces here. So we all know that, you know, that one of the challenges is getting people to open up and declare the vulnerability. And I know, Chris, you've, you've done papers and talked about, you know, getting a really good value exchange. But in terms of the reluctance for consumers to declare vulnerability, regardless whether it's tech or it's telephony, um, is, is that perceived this is going to impact the service I get, the lending decision I get, um, you know, gambling, you know, there, there's, that's shrouded in shame, etc. So, I mean, just a sort of a, a quick view from the panel there in terms of have we, have we, have we pushed forward on that? Do we think we've, we've really achieved that sort of disclosure? Do we think that's still an issue? Yeah, we, we hear that a lot on our helpline um, and our advisors would, would, you know, frequently say people don't want to speak to their banks or their creditors about, about gambling harm, but we would encourage them to open up and talk about their vulnerabilities. Um, uh, and we do tell people, you know, it's in, in this day and age, it's not going to kind of affect how, how your bank uh, is going to treat you. They, in fact, they might be able to, to help you. So there's also from, from bank staff there's, uh, or creditor staff, there's a lot of resistance about talking uh, about gambling harms to customers. And uh, people and staff feel like um, customers will just simply say, no, I don't have a problem and don't kind of don't go in there. But as a gambling support charity, we say plant the seed. They may not be ready to talk about it now, but tell them about the free help and um, 
support available, tell them about the tools and it might kind of stay there. And when that moment comes, they will, they will remember that kind person uh, from their bank who, who recommended a service. Beth. Yeah, I absolutely think there's still uh, an issue and I think a lot of it comes down to education and um, that reluctance to engage is understandable if you think that they, there's no relationship often from when they take a loan to potentially when they start to get into trouble. And so the first time that they're then getting that engagement, um, it might be that there's an offer of uh, support there and it might be signposting to maybe free debt um, advice. But the reality is that often they don't necessarily trust or don't have that relationship in place. And so they'll then go to the internet and there's a whole heap of misinformation uh, where Bob says, don't, don't engage, they won't chase you for the debt. Or you know, that's if they're even being proactive at that, at that point. So I think we've really got to understand um, and, and probably think about actually how people consume information these days. Um, TikTok <laughs> and things like that are, are the channels that people are turning yeah. to. It sounds ridiculous uh, to think in that way in some ways, but if you think about um, the new ways that people are looking for information, I think we've got to really rethink how we're spreading information so that people actually get what they need at the right time and they're encouraged to make contact and encouraged to disclose because I yeah, just don't think I mean, we've moved TikTok to TikTok is, I mean... Was it the majority of 24-year-olds use TikTok as their preferred search engine? Yep. Um, and we, we've done some research. Um, I think there's 4.7 billion ta uh, hashtags on FinTok on, on, uh, on, on TikTok. So people are taking financial advice and using that. So how do we compete against 4.7 billion? Um, yeah. Um, answers on a postcard um, but that's where people are going and, and the misinformation and that's a tech platform that is very much here to say and there's probably others mer emerging as we speak so final word to you uh, mr fitch because i can see that i'm getting weighed that time's up uh, final word in terms of disclosure you've been in this world for a long long time and you've been well you have um and and you know done some amazing work how how far do you think we've come on disclosure and are we there yet? Okay. Um, ten words, because I can see the session's wrapping up. Money and Mental Health Policy Institute, guide on disclosure environments. We'll tell you the barriers, the facilitators, and what you can do about it. And yes, I did start working in this industry in 1873. So, yeah. But do you, so think, do you think we've made progress? Um, yeah, but is it enough? I don't think it is. Okay. Brilliant. Well, thank you. I mean, as I say, 30 minutes to cover a huge topic, but please uh, join me in thanking our panel um, uh, for their thoughts. <laughs>